Fantastic stuff. And now please welcome to the stage a man who plays Captain Nicholson Warhorse, Mr. Tom Hiddleston. And the co-writer of Warhorse, Richard Curtis. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Nice to see you. Is this on? Yeah. I think it's on. Nice to see you. Uh, so, gentlemen, how did you get Certainly. the fall for this film? Uh, it's a. Uh, do you, you can't say no when Steven Spielberg comes knocking your, on your door, can you? You got involved before I did. Yeah, no, it was a. It was a curious thing. I did say maybe. I did say okay. wait because what happened is I was uh, having uh, tea with a friend of mine who works with him, and Stephen came in and they started talking about it and said, "Would you like to?" have a look at it because mm -hmm. it was sort of stalled and I said uh, I'm, I said let me go away for a week mm -hmm. see what I would do and then come back and after a week when I'd seen the play read the book mm -hmm. uh, I then sent my my exam paper to Stephen and he marked it <laughs> and I got 8 out of 10 um, <laughs> and that was just enough and so I got the job Okay, so you hadn't, you, you were aware obviously of a war horse, but you hadn't seen the play, no. or you hadn't read the book? No. And in fact, I read the book out loud to my daughter okay. to try and get the dramatic experience of the book rather than a literary experience of the book. Oh, that's interesting, because obviously the book is narrated by Joey. Yeah. You what voice did he use? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I tell you, while I, was <laughs> while I was writing the film, I did have horse days where I would just be the horses, and I have a partner's desk with my girlfriend. And on those days, I just, she said, I neighed and poured <laughs> and, uh, the whole way through. So I have done a lot of horse impressions. Fantastic. Well, Tom could ride me. He can ride <laughs> horses. He's, he's very proud of riding now. But anyway, you asked him how indeed, he got indeed. involved. So Tom, how did you get involved? Uh, actually, I was, I was, I was, um, it was all in the middle of making um, Thor mm -hmm. uh, around that time. And um, I was back in the UK for a brief second for, for my dad's 70th birthday. And we, we took him away on holiday, and, and just before I was due to fly back to LA, my English agent called and said, look, I know this isn't ideal, but I'm gonna email you some size tonight, you have gotta put yourself on tape tomorrow, and then you can fly back to LA. And I was like, I haven't got time, I haven't got time to prepare, and anyway, what is it? And he said, well, it's top secret, but I know that it's War Horse. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, because I recognize the uh, character's names. Oh, okay. Because he yeah. represents, uh, also uh, represents Luke Treadaway, okay. who yeah. played Albert in the very first um, National Theatre stage production. And he recognized Albert, Captain Nichols. Hang on a second. They're talking about Joey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I put myself on tape uh, very, very quickly in my agent's office, um, obsessively um, perf perfectionist about my reading. Which was which is the scene where where Nichols buys the horse, which we'll see you soon. That's it. Yeah. See you a little bit, and um, and then I flew back to I, I, at the time. Also, my agent said it's being directed by Clint Eastwood, and I was like, <laughs> right. Well, I'm never going to get it um, because it's Clint, and he can pick anyone he likes. So anyway, I put myself on tape and thought I just want to do a good job, and went back to LA and thought nothing about it. Mm -hmm. In the middle of um, hanging off the edge of the Rainbow Bridge, uh, <laughs> I uh, I. Um, took a call from my American agent who said, Steven Spielberg wants to meet you next week. And I said, why? <laughs> and they said, well, he's directing War Horse and, and he loves your tape. And, I, and I, so anyway, I, I drove over there and, and we sat down and talked about Thor and, and how much he admired Kenneth Branagh. And, and um, strangely, I'd started to ride at that time because we were practicing some ride, a riding sequence along the Rainbow Bridge, which is very brief in, in mm. Thor, but I had fallen in love with horse riding anyway. Mm. Um, and I was galloping up and down um, riverbeds in, in a place called uh, Simi Valley, which were... What's that? I live there. This lady lives in <laughs> Simi Valley. Anyway, so these riverbeds are, are kind of peopled with, with, with this beautiful young woman, um, but also with, uh, with rattlesnakes and, and coyotes. And, and that okay. was where I was... Yeah. Um, where I was learning and then eventually uh, I sort of said you know he said do you ride and I said yes I do and, and then quite suddenly he said I'd like you to do it wow that's you could have had a beard conversation he might have wanted <laughs> to see you about beards <laughs> he, he, might, he, he might have but I wasn't I didn't have my beard then oh, okay. unfortunately so you had the, um, you, were, you were in full Loki not, not costume I, obviously when no, you went yeah, to see Steven Spielberg <laughs> but, but you had the look so on tape you were on tape I had in, long black yeah. blue black hair and, and uh, he said that he said he wasn't bothered by that and, okay. um, 
but yeah, it was yeah. Anyway, there we so go. So nothing from the look he seeped into your uh, your your, no, your, your read on tape. <laughs> I did. I did actually tell him. I said, look, I think I should probably cut my hair and change go <laughs> and change it color. And he said, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's a little dark right now. Um, but that's how I got involved. Fantastic. Um, well, I think we have a we have a series of clips. So we set up the first one, uh, Richard, if you can. It's the uh, uh, scene from the very beginning of the film. Yes, the um, uh, Albert's dad has gone to market to buy a sensible uh, workhorse, <laughs> and he's seduced by the beauty of the little young horse that he sees, and also by a sense of competitive anger that his landlord thinks he can buy anything. So uh, he rashly, for all the money he has, um, buys the horse Joey. Fantastic. Let's take a look. I believe the, uh, the part where the horse hits Peter Mullen in the face was entirely improvised. Is that, is that, <laughs> is that true? Yeah. Well, the, the ho I mean, the working with those horses was incredible because um, there were 14 different uh, horses who played Joey and th they don't know they're in a film they're just behaving um, and the sort of holy grail of, of acting for camera is really about trying to get close to behavior as opposed mm. to performance and they had so much to teach us about that but 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 the horse playing with rubbing himself up and down on the back of Peter Mullen's jacket and all that um, hat stuff was totally improvised and spontaneous and Stephen loved it and everybody around with it and there are lots of things like that in the film where the horse would do something utterly accidental and it would look like the most beautiful piece of acting you've ever seen. Absolutely. And uh, Richard, can you talk about the challenges of this script? Uh, first of all, tonally, I guess, because it starts off, it's very broad, very lush in, in a way, emotionally at the beginning of the film, but it gets darker gradually, it goes into some very, very dark territory. Was it difficult to, to handle that as a screenwriter, to, to tread? Um, look, it was a it was a joy working with Stephen. It wasn't mm. very scary working with him because he's very um, uh, fertile of mind. Mm. So if you come up with one idea, he'll say, uh, or you could do this, or this, or this, or this, um, and you just steal his best idea and then, <laughs> uh, say it's yours. But in a way, the real challenge that we had was was more to do with the structure of yeah. it and with trying to um i think make each world 360 degrees to try and give the feeling that you could have given a whole film mm. to each of those worlds so that we we were starting again time after time mm. um and so in case people don't know the, the film structurally follows joey it's a sort of battle yeah. we talked about it like a relay race yeah yeah joey keeps moving through and in fact the first thing that i did when i came on board was take albert the boy mm -hmm. out of the middle of the of the movie because when i read the novel to my daughter and in the novel he disappears because joey the horse only sees who he sees yeah um and when we got to the end and albert came back in again i had trouble reading because I was crying <laughs> and she had trouble listening because she was crying yeah. and I thought well that's enough that is going to work so we can take the big risk mm -hmm. of pulling Albert out and then going with this more radical with the more radical structure and the play is structured in a, in a the play well. puts yeah the play yeah. puts Albert back in more into mm -hmm. weaves him mm -hmm. I think because yeah. I mean partly one of the I, I hope I hope everyone reads the books. It's the most beautiful book. And if you can see the play, see the play. Mm. And each of these things has been able to add a new dimension. Mm. And, and the film does have the extraordinary horses and does have this extraordinary epic beauty and size. You know, the, the no man's land is no man's land. Mm. Did, you, did uh, the fact that it was a World War I movie, did that give you pause in any way? Because you, you've... You're responsible for one of the great works about World War One and Blackadder Goes Forth, which is just amazing. Um, were you worried about mining the same territory? Or? <coughs> Not really, no. I mean, I had more pause about doing Blackadder, which did seem like a risky proposition mm -hmm. to try and be funny about the, one of the worst things that ever happened. Um, so, no, in fact, I was delighted to revisit, revisit the war in, um, you know, in, a, in a completely different, in a different way. And I, I was really thrilled on, um, at the premiere here. 
my 10-year-old son was given the job of handing Prince William a book of the film beforehand. So he's, he described it the day before. He said, uh, you realize tomorrow is the most important day of my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and and we went we we he we had, went through all this stuff and he saw the princess and he stood next to Stephen and then we watched the movie and we got into the cab afterwards and he said I've learnt one thing from tonight and I thought he was going to say you know royals are just like normal people or I shouldn't get nervous and I and he, I said what did you learn and he said I've learnt you must never ever go to war it's mm. stupid stupid thing mm. so. Uh, I love still being engaged in the issue of telling people how foolish war is. Absolutely. But it's a, there's a wonderful thread that runs throughout the film and really comes together towards the end, um, if anyone has seen it, and if not, look forward to it, um, about decency in war uh, and decency coming out in people I mean, you know, on both sides. It's and a sort of key... Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, I mean, we both feel in the end that's the key yeah. message of the film. And I think by the end of the film you feel this tremendous sort of yearning for peace because mm. everybody the horse encounters on both sides pretty nearly is full of a sort of common sense of decency and a hope that it will end mm. and the horse is, is is an emblem of of our capacity for courage mm. and and uh and and hope and it, it, it sort of the 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 talisman, if you like, of the horse appeals to the best in our humanity. Mm. And, and that somehow everybody who comes into contact with Joey, be they English or German or French, or if they're officer class or privates, they're reminded of something that's innately good within, yeah. within themselves. And I think to, to, to make a film about that subject, really, that our, our capacity for love set against the backdrop of one of the most horrific acts of atrocity that we committed against each other is a very beautiful thing to, thing to make a film about. Absolutely. It strikes me as well that um, in the war sequences at least, there's not really an overt villain in the, in the movie. Um, was that again the, a deliberate... The enemy is war yeah. itself. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, well, let's talk about Captain Nichols next, uh, Tom. I mean, uh, there's a clip first where we meet Captain Nichols, if you can set it up. Uh, so this is, this is um, the moment in the film where... Uh, Joey and Albert have been friends for a while and they've become almost um, like spiritual brothers and war is declared in the summer of 1914 and the world has changed and um, Captain Nichols is, is an officer in the North Somerset Yeomanry which is a regiment of the British Cavalry and he's arrived in the village in Devon to scout for mounts and Ted Narricutt played by Peter Mullen sells Joey to Captain Nichols for 30 guineas and Albert is not happy about it. Roll the clip. Uh, Tom, you, uh, you had a heck of a year last year. Um, yeah. He's got uh, very nice eyes, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, they, they really pop <laughs> out. It was like that, <laughs> that scene is like an eye competition <laughs> and Tom's clearly winning. <laughs> So Jeremy tries crying to see whether or not if he does the crying, maybe he'll distract people from the blueness. Is it true your eyes are almost entirely CG? Yeah. Is that true? Or yeah, yeah, everything about <laughs> your real CG. eyes, just, yeah. to, just to verify that. But you, you had a crack in here last year. You had the Archipelago and the Deep Blue Sea, but I think yeah. most mainstream audiences will know you as Loki in Thor, who's yeah. a thoroughly rotten egg. Now, as far as Captain is. Nichols is a good egg. So was it, a, was it nice to play the contrast and let people know you're not a rapscallion? Definitely, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, I, I suppose I, I, uh, I'm always drawn to complexity in, in roles. I think um, um, Loki is a kind of heroic villain, certainly in his own mind. And, and Captain Nichols is a flawed hero. Mm. Um, because in the story... He's the agent of separation. Mm. He doesn't want to separate these two, you know, Albert from his, his animal. And I think it, it was a huge, um, as soon as I read it actually, and it was that scene that was the first thing I read, you described him, you des I think you described in the screenplay, you described Captain Nichols as a, a modest, decent, upper class English officer. And modest and decent. Devilish, devilishly handsome, blue-eyed cat <laughs> is, is what the original draft said. <laughs> okay, but, I don't know if I read that one. Uh, but it was the, the it's like like Richard was saying, the decency was something that really appealed. That that that, that um, 
I wanted to play. It was it was so nice to play somebody who was good mm. and um, to represent the doomed youth mm. of a lost generation um, and uh, the, you know a generation of gentlemen officers who adhered to a kind of chivalry and and a code of honor that was never really seen again. Mm. And they'd inherited a value system from their, their, their fathers and, and grandfathers about the way war should be fought in the Boer War. I mean, up until this point, that's the thing we tend to forget is cavalry charges were on the whole mm. very, very successful mm. because they were terrifying. And all regiments of horse had advantage over regiments of foot because you, you had pace, speed and power and height. And the British army, in all of their innocence, thought that sending the cavalry over to northern France to, tell, to teach the Kaiser a thing or two mm. would, would be effective. Mm. And they really had no idea about the, the, the developments of the technologies of the German military and the, the extent of the use of the machine gun. And um, I really, like myself and, and Benedict Cumberbatch and, and Patrick Kennedy, really, really felt a sort of responsibility that inside this huge story where you touch on the faces of so many different kinds of people mm. in the First World War, we were those British officers that, that Siegfried Sassoon and, and Wilfred Owen wrote about, um, that never came home. Mm. Um, so there was an innocence to it and, uh, and a humour too. I mean, there's a great banter between the three of us and, and we're all quite competitive and, mm. in, in, before we go, you know, who's got the fastest horse and all that stuff. And that was really fun. It was just cap a... banter as well, yeah. About, the, about, the, ban the, about the cap. A bit about the, the cap, about the cap. Yeah, yeah. It was all, they were very stylish... Um, young guys. I don't know if it's of any interest, but the three of us read the autobiography of Siegfried Sassoon called mm -hmm. Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man. Mm -hmm. And it made us realize <coughs> that actually all the cavalry officers, they weren't professional soldiers, they were, ge they were sort of country gentlemen used to living off the land who, who hunted in the winter and the cavalry was sort of what they did to, to keep the horses fit in the summer. So it was a different kind of, of soldiery. Mm -hmm. And there's a great sense of futility uh, as well, of, yeah. of life's loss, of talents yeah. lost. I mean, Nichols yeah. is clearly a talented artist. Where, where did that come? Was that Richard? Was yeah. that your creation, or the fact that? Uh, no, that's in the no, book. No, that's, that's, okay. that's in the book. It's in yeah. the book and in the film, yeah. and uh, I mean, in the, in the play, and it's it's very very moving. And there is there are scenes which would have taken too long in the film, but um, I should say it comes from something that Michael Morpurgo said when he had interviewed. Um, ex-cavalryman who had come home in the First World War at his local pub in Devon, they had said that the only people the, the officers felt they could talk to were the horses. And so the officers would go into the stables at night and you could hear officers talking to the horses and sort of saying, you know, I'm afraid and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And, and the, the horses became these, these silent, mute confidants for, for the, the officers' terror. And um, in, in the book, Michael Morpurgo has Captain Nichols go into the stable at night to get away from the kind of bravado of the, uh, the officer's mess. Mm. And he talks to Joey and, and he sketches him while he's talking to him. And that, and that Joey's, you know, because the, the, the novel is told from Joey's perspective, um, it soothes him and it makes him feel safe. And he's not at home. He's not in Devon anymore. He's in this um, new environment with 300 other horses, 400 other horses. He's only seen three other horses in his life and suddenly there's 300 it's like yeah. being going to school for the first time and Captain Nichols is there calming him down mm. yeah. can I just say I think that because I can say it without any praise to myself <laughs> but the, the section as it were after you've drawn the horse the, 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 the section with Captain Nichols and the charges I think is one of the most extraordinary bits of filmmaking I've ever seen and there are a couple of very extraordinary things that Tom does in it but it really there, there's some amazing things you know we're, we're very lucky to be around with a with a filmmaker as great as Stephen is and when you watch it for the third or fourth time mm -hmm. you're slightly in wonder at the grace and beauty of each shot and the way this extraordinary 10 minutes of filmmaking it, it comes together it's mm. I mean i I think all my only contribution is the word charge, <laughs> uh, so I don't have to worry. But it's a, it's an amazing thing to to watch. He is yeah. he is a great genius, and it's very easy, you know, to sort of put things next to his work and say this is the way that Stephen works mm. and mm -hmm. what's the next Stephen film. But you are just watching someone who is as 
pitch perfect as the Beatles, you know, mm. yeah. as, as extraordinary the things that he lays before us yeah. as what you get on one of their albums. Absolutely. And so speaking of which, our next clip is the, uh, the charge. Not all the charge, not all 10 minutes, but uh, yeah. a couple of minutes at least. And how is that for a seamless segue? Roll the clip, please. Thank you. Just a taster, just a small just a taster. Yeah. But uh, how was that the shoot? That was all on the soundstage in Luton, wasn't it? Or, <laughs> or, or was it actually shot? That was I t I honestly one of the most exciting days of my entire life. Right. Um, that day was the, d the now, day... This is a man who's kissed Ken Branagh. <laughs> <laughs> Not just Repeatedly. <laughs> with, with or without tongues, because um, that's, that's, yeah. the, that's the... Uh, okay. <laughs> that's the yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was... It was um, it was it was incredible we, we were lined up in those in those um in the wheat field which had actually been sort of transported from some marshes onto the duke of wellington's estate which is doubling as northern france and uh i arrived at seven o'clock in the morning dressed in all my buckles and belts and whistles ready to go and they were rehearsing the last they were rehearsing it with the stunt riders mm -hmm. and the first thing that happened stephen that inimitable silhouette the baseball cap, <laughs> the beard, the barber, calls and said, Tom, come on, look at the shot. Yeah. And he shows me this thing that um, of, essentially, there was a, um, a stunt rider standing in for me, okay. um, chasing a tracking vehicle, uh, a four by four car, with a, a camera crane, with that, and the camera sort of hanging out the back of it, which is remote controlled. And 120 horses, charging at 40 miles an hour across 400 meters of open field to um, a, an immaculately recreated German camp with 300 <laughs> extras running away. And, uh, and I was having, you know, the stunt rider was having to stay within 10 feet of the lens, yeah. no further forward because he'd been out of focus, no further back, out of focus. That's um, and he said, <gasps> you good to do this, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, sir, and got on this horse, and I could feel, I mean, horses are so sensitive, they can feel everything you're feeling. If they can sense fear, they can sense confidence, they can sense calm and peace, they can sense arrogance. The moment you have airs and graces, you're off. Um, and I remember just trying to just, I mean, it, my Joey was like a Ferrari. He, he, was, he was so sensitive. The moment you put your foot on the accelerator, it was just like, whoa. And he was pouring the ground. And, you know, just like, he, so he was ready to go. And I was like, whoa, boy, whoa. Just take it easy. And the crew needed to take their time for focus marks and lights. Final things needed to be checked. And then eventually I heard this roll sound. I thought, God, here we go. You know, I, I could see like five, six hundred yards ahead of me was the end of where I was going to be. There are 30 horses fanning out to my left, another 30 behind me, 30 behind them. You could hear the swords and the metal clinking against the sides of the, the bridles and the saddles and all these, all of, the, all of these horses doing this mm. and, ever, and stunt riders going, whoa, whoa, and, and <laughs> just the noise of it. And I thought this is about as real as it gets. Roll sound. Camera speed, sound speed, camera set. And then on the bullhorn, Steven Spielberg, my childhood hero. <laughs> okay, Tom. Action. And calling out the orders, um, which you see Benedict give in the film. Uh -huh. And finally, once we're at full canter, raising my sword and screaming charge at the top of my lungs. And then the first thing I remember, if I remember anything, is the noise. Yeah the noise of the hooves and the noise of 120 stuntmen screaming charge at the top of their lungs and the wind in my face and the feeling of, of essentially the miracle of human flight, letting this, this living, breathing Ferrari run and feeling how excited the horse was, and how excited I was, this tracking vehicle tearing up to my left. And uh, by the end, I, by the time I got to the other, to the other side, I, I just... Tears were streaming down my face, and <laughs> you know there was no acting required. It was absolutely amazing. Wow, amazing! We did it for about we did it for about a week. The whole section took about a week because there were all sorts of kills. And Benedict comes through a tent at one point. Mm -hmm. Patrick Kennedy jumps through, jumps over a fire, and and um, it was uh, to be at the centre of an action sequence directed by pro probably the greatest action director who's who's ever worked in the medium was, was an amazing privilege. It's Did great to do a movie where action actually means action, isn't it? Because in my <laughs> yeah. movies, action means 
have a cup of tea <laughs> and tell someone you love them, right, right. which isn't really action, is but it? But that's a rather beautiful yeah, thing. That's, that's yeah. another kind of action. Yeah. So, Richard, yeah. you really just I, wrote... I rate movies about people who want more action. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And they get it at the end of the movie. <laughs> they get a after better... After the credits. Probably a better kind of action, yeah, yeah, arguably. Yeah, a more pleasing kind of a action. A more long-lasting yeah. action, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Did you really just write charge for that sequence, or was it a little bit more? No, than that? you wrote the whole. Yeah, These yeah, yeah, very, yeah, very modest. It's there, it's there's it's all seven very pages of, <laughs> of, of yeah. seven pages of stuff. It's amazing, and it, and and each beat as well was meticulously planned by both Richard and Stephen. And Not bad. Um, I remember, and you did stuff about people's attitudes to it and um, German reactions. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a. It's the climactic scene for three of the most important mm. characters in the movie for us for a start. So. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's get some of your questions now. Um, put your hands up, yes, uh, and then we'll get some floating microphones going around you guys in the front row here, please. Okay, hello. Um, you've touched a little bit on what it's like to work with His Holiness Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Could you elaborate? Was it overwhelming? Because I spent 60 seconds in his company the other day and was talking 10 to the dozen. Oh, I love Park. So could you let us know what it like, was like? Like now. Yeah, <laughs> I was really rambling more than now. Well, I, I, I've got, I mean, two things. I thought he hated me because <laughs> in about 1994, I went to the Césars, which is an award ceremony in France, and they have one award for foreign films. And, and I remember the nominees included Four Weddings and Funeral, Schindler's List, and I think Pulp Fiction or something. And this very serious German film director came out and said, I'm about to give the award for best foreign film. Mr. Spielberg, if you do not win this award, it is an insult to the honor of France <laughs> and the intelligence of all the French people that will never be forgotten. And then he opened the envelope and four weddings had won because <laughs> it was a popular vote done in cinemas. And... Uh, so I always assumed he hated me. So my entire relationship has just been waiting for the moment <laughs> when he snaps. Because he's such a charming, gentle, friendly, instinctive man um, mm. to deal with, isn't he? Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing that you've, you, when you first meet him, you just get so struck by his extraordinary kindness. Um, and his humility he just is so collaborative. He's so honest about what he can and can't do. Um, and uh, and then utterly brilliant in a way that I'm not sure he realizes. Just the just the clarity and the, the, the speed of his thought about filmmaking, about shots, about um, about what's emotionally needed in a scene. It's a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, if for him, it's it's something that he 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 so clearly envisages in his own mind almost like a kind of one of those enormous puzzles that my mum used to get for Christmas. <laughs> he sees the picture before he makes it, and then he's just about helping people make that picture. He cuts in, in at lunchtime and, and on Saturday, so that by the time we finish that, you know, the first, we did two weeks of that cavalry charge, which means he was in the edit on the first Saturday. And by the time we came in for the, to start the second week, he'd cut all of the first week's footage and was ready to just... So he didn't waste anyone's time and he, and he knew exactly how to get what he needed out of everybody. This Meanwhile, thing of, oh, no, it's just like he'll direct everybody immaculately to do their thing. Janusz Kaminska, I need you to do this. Rob Inch, the, the stunt choreographer, I need you to do this. Tom, I need you to do this. Um, can we get some horses ready for this thing? Uh, and then he'll say, what were you asking about? Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Anyway, <laughs> so Sean Connery's in the air balloon, and then he tells you for 25 minutes, he tells you the anecdote you've always wanted to know. And it's just that the generosity of the man is, is um, astounding. Is there a yeah, I, mean, I, I thought when we were writing it, working on writing it, that's the, 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 the richness of his ideas. He, he can, just like you'd expect a great musician to just be able to play you a new tune, he does imagine five minutes of cinema just off the top of his head. So you would say, well, this is what's going to happen. You say, okay, well, how about the fact that they're sitting there and then suddenly he looks out the window and you see a whole bunch of German trucks. When you get there, you can see that they're not Germans and 400 people spill out. They spill across the field. They pluck all the fruit from across the field. He's in there and you say, <clears throat> yeah, 
that sounds good. <laughs> and they say, but what, if, what happens if we try something a bit smaller? And he'll go, um, okay. So they're sitting there in the room, and then why see one single German walking along? And he'll come up with another whole yeah. five minutes. It's, it's as though a, a tap that is shut with many people is open with him. And then on the day, I was very impressed by his fluidity. You know, it suddenly strikes you that, as it were, Picasso didn't turn to anyone else and say, is it okay if I do a bit of blue here? <laughs> and, and I thought this line was going to be straight, but I think I'll curve it. You know, uh, he's got that ease on the day yeah. of, of uh, not behaving as mm. though there are 300 people and all that complexity, but of simply shaping what he sees and wants. Yeah. Isn't that right? And in the most deft and supportive way, I remember that there's a scene between Patrick Kennedy and myself in the officer's mess before we go to France. And it was, we'd been outside doing all this external stuff, a lot of action, and it was a really intimate scene. And we were inside suddenly. And he was getting himself in the mood by playing soundtracks. And then he let the shot be set up, and he, just, and he suddenly, quite suddenly said to Mitch Dubin, his long-term camera operator, he said, Mitch, I got this one. And he sat behind the camera, got on the, got on the uh, seat, and he, and, he, and, he, and he just got behind the lens and said, Tom, you don't mind if I, if I shoot this, do you? And I was like, <laughs> no. But it was, he didn't say this, but it was his way of saying, it's between you and me now. I'm sitting in the front row. And it was just the most beautiful, supportive act of generosity. He's, he's incredible. Yes, the gentleman in the uh, middle here. If you can get the microphone out. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Hi. Uh, I'd just like to ask you a quick question of regarding your process in terms mm. of um, uh, getting into the character and what was your kind of like research did you have to do do any research in terms of the the character itself uh yes i did um i always do and i don't i, I don't have any hard and fast rules um i wish i did it would make my life so much easier but but uh, what i tend to do is I, I suppose it comes from a kind of terror that i will never i won't have done enough and that um initially and that, that I'll be playing too close to home and that somehow too much of Tom or too much of the wrong part of Tom will bleed into the character. And um, it's very important to me to build a world around the character that, that, that exists in my imagination. And it doesn't, I don't, it doesn't matter who it is. And that can come from anything. It can come from books I read um, uh, or music or films or images or, or just things that people say. You tend to... It's like... With each character, once I, once I got a job and I know I'm doing it and I know I'm starting in eight weeks' time, everything I see or hear is, is filtered or I'm listening to it at a particular frequency. And I go, ah, that's useful. You know, I'll be watching the news and it'll be about the war in Afghanistan. And I'll be like, soldiery, family, honor, decency. But um, with this particular part, what was most important for me was was his mixture of um, kindness and decency and also discipline and propriety so that he wasn't, that he was believably a soldier and also but someone who was just very kind. And um, I read so much. I read lots of uh, First World War stuff. I reread Journey's End by R.C. Sheriff, which is brilliant on that, Birdsong the poems of Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. I watched everything, every horse film I could. Um, the Errol Flynn, Charge of the Light Brigade, um, right the way through to Sea Biscuit and, um, you know, um, Black Beauty and um, what's the, there's an Australian one, the name I've forgotten now. Um, the Horse Whisperer. Uh, Waterloo, there's a fantastic film of Waterloo, actually. Um, and also just the riding. I mean, I, I read, I read the, the 30 pages of Richard's screenplay that I was in, and I was on a horse basically the entire time. And Stephen had said to me, I want you to do all this riding. There are no stunt doubles. And I thought, my God, I have to look immaculate. And, and there was a, the thrill of learning a new discipline, of learning a new skill um, in approaching a role. The, the same, I, I would do the same if I was playing... You know, I, I haven't done it yet, and I may never. But if I was playing a boxer, I'd have to learn to box. If, if I, you know, in, in playing the in the Marvel films, I, I do do a lot of physical training because I fight a hell of a lot, and I do a specific um, kind of training because he fights in a very specific kind of way. Mm. 
You just have to do as much as you can. That's all, that's all, that's all really. Fantastic. And uh, now the gentleman in the front row, we'll get to you guys in a second. Tom, first of all, congratulations on yet another astonishing performance. Um, Thank you. You've worked with some extraordinary Thank filmmakers, you know, Woody, um, Kenneth Branagh, but I think by your own admission, Stephen's something special and unique. I wonder what you think as a performer you've learned specifically from Stephen that you maybe haven't from anyone you've worked with before. And also as, as an admitted boyhood fan, um, is there a particular Stephen film, uh, apart from War Horse, that touched you when you were younger and, and can maybe talk a little bit about why he as a filmmaker has meant so much to you? He goes a great, great question. Um, it's so hard to think of one thing that I learned from him. Um, what, I, what, what I was most inspired by is that with his filmography and his CV and his standing and position in this business, um, his passion and curiosity and integrity and joy for the whole thing, for making films, um, understanding the responsibility of the numbers of people who are going to watch those films, is as present as it must have been when he first picked up a camera. He, he just loves it so much. He never takes a second for granted. He still gets frightened. What am I going to do today? Um, his ability to improvise and, 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 um, and not set things in stone. That, that The magic of cinema is the magic of capturing life in its accidental form um, and not to lock things down and, and say it has to be this way. And as Richard was saying, his fluidity, his, his fleetness of foot and his sense of humor and his, it really his joy um, that a man like that could, could, see a, could see a story like this and think, yeah, that's what I need to do. Um, I, I was just so moved by it that you know, I should be so lucky if I'm even still working at his age and with that kind of passion and integrity. Um, I've, I've, in the past, I've talked about Indiana Jones a lot, but, but, but I remember going to see Jurassic Park and it was I literally so t the war horse opens today and however many years ago it was the opening Friday of Jurassic Park I had badgered my mum and dad I was 12 to go and see the dinosaurs for weeks and they took me to the Odeon on Magdalen Street in Oxford where we lived and I drank so much Coca-Cola during the trailers <laughs> that by the time the T-Rex was about to stamp on Sam Neill uh, in that unforgettable sequence, I was so desperate for the loo. <laughs> but I couldn't go. Because to all intents and purposes, Steven Spielberg had created the childhood dream of seeing dinosaurs for me. And... I think that Steven Spielberg, in his, the course of his career, has, has every time changed the game. And he's created what has before seemed impossible. Um, and in a way, we're so used to it now, to, to, to computer-generated monsters, that we forget the impact that that made. You are actually looking at dinosaurs with people in a, in a, film, a film that seemed to be within the bounds of plausibility, sort of. Um, but stick Richard Attenborough in it and pretend it's his park and you'll believe anything. Um, and I, I, just, I just loved it and I saw it again, I think, the following day and didn't drink any Coca-Cola. <laughs> and, um, and I remember even, even this is a, the first time I've admitted this in public, my first professional theatre job um, was a play called The Changeling, which we took around Europe uh, with a, a company called Cheek by Jowl. And I shared a dressing room with a very good friend of mine called Lawrence Spellman, who's also an actor. And for some reason, our dressing room door reminded us of the kitchen door <laughs> in uh, Jurassic Park, <laughs> where the kids are trying to get away from the raptors. And I, ha I got sent the other day by him, in sort of the spirit of Spielberg, a video of myself as a velociraptor <laughs> um, shot only about five years ago <laughs> under a theater in Paris um, trying to get in to eat the children. So one could say it's had a very lasting impact. That's very dangerous. Is there any way we can tempt you to do the <laughs> velociraptor tonight? <laughs> Damn it. No, uh, Richard. Well, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Richard, can I throw the same question to you? Oh, there we go. Amazing. 
<laughs> it was the walk. It was all about the walk. I had the walk down. And the, the call. The claw, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Never knew you'd see that tonight when you came yeah. out, did you? Um, Richard, going to throw the, the same question to you very quickly? What well, you I, from, the, uh, the, the, the movie I talked to Stephen a little bit about uh, while we were working on this was, in fact, Close Encounters. Because mm. I've always thought Close Encounters was a very curious and symphonic movie. It's a movie that just keeps moving towards its destination. It hasn't got a plot like a... It's sort of... It's just slowly building via mashed potato to the... <laughs> just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more satisfying and just continues to grow. And, and I was just was always saying, you're a master of unusual narrative and there's no reason we should be frightened to make the, the way this movie operates... Mm. Uh, uh, unusual as well. So I think in some ways, Close Encounters, I think one of his most marvellous films. Fantastic. Uh, sadly, we've only got time for one more question. Uh, I saw you uh, uh, first, so, uh, yeah, this lady here. Thank you. Sorry, people behind me and people on the, on the right. I hope it's a good one. I feel <laughs> the honour of this. Um, Tom, you touched on it a little bit before when you talked about the sounds of the swords clanking and how that kind of brought you into the moment of the charge. And I just wanted to ask a little bit how you brought in the authenticity of that time period, how the props contributed to it, how the speech contributed to it, how that impacted your performance and kind of the lengths you went to as a crew to ensure that was as authentic as possible. Well, I start with the dialogue. I mean, my first line is, is, um, is full of such... Uh, military formality that it, 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 it um, I spent a lot of time acting in period as well, it's just weird, but m the, my first line to Peter Mullen's character is, and how much are you charging, sir, for this strong, decent and very fine animal? And even just the adjective fine is, 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 is something that, that conjures up a world to me, you know, um, a very fine thing, you know, the, the sort of, the, it was a very I don't know, it just, it just gives me a sense of, of what it must have been like. And um, I'm so lucky that, that, that Stephen's resources are, are, are so um, abundant that, that I had the best, the best of, of everything around me. I had the best groomsmen looking after the horses. I had the most beautiful costume, um, quite literally um, crafted to my exact measurements. Um, with, 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 with authentic material and by, you know, ad advised by brilliant military historians as the specifics of things. Every insignia, all, all the belts and buckles, it was all sort of um, as it should have been. And um, we were taught by the, those same historians about protocol and the instructions you would say. And it was a very technical thing. And there are only three CGI shots in the movie. Yeah. So it was very authentic experience. And none of they the CGI shots that. involved anything that I was part of or our section. That They're all Tom's hair. <laughs> <laughs> and eyes, yeah. yeah. And face, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Richard, um, how hard do you strive as a writer to evoke that sense of period, not just in the dialogue, but in, in directions and general mood? Do you know, actually, it cuts both ways with me. I would mm. probably say I was the least authentic insofar as... You know, my, I felt my, I was charged with trying to make the people <coughs> as, I, we did this in Blackadder, this strange mixture of making sure you're right mm. and not having anything which is anachronistic, but then within how you think people talk in that situation to make them as normal and chatty and friendly as you can. So in a way, I'm always fighting against the restrictions of that so that you can find as many modern cadences, because I don't think people have changed mm. all yeah. that much in many ways. So. Although the dialect would have done. I mean, the thing, the thing is, if we'd actually spoken in a, in a dialect that was, in, that was absolutely true to the time, it would have, I think, seemed alienating to an audience, it, it, because it was, the vowel sounds are so different and so clipped. I mean, and, and, and people's voices were higher, just naturally, so it would have been, you know, and how much are you charging, sir, for this... Strong, decent, and very fine animal. <laughs> and I think, I, th I, I personally can't, I can't relate, I think it's admirable when I yeah. see that, but I can't relate to it. Yeah. And so there has to be, you have to meet it halfway, I think. Fantastic. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. Well, that's, in a way, that's, well, that's, that's what, what I'm do. saying, that, yeah. that, that you, 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 you make it right for, for now. It always worries me when, when, when historical movies are, are done so accurately that it, it, it alienates you from, 
from the time. And there's a wonderful bit between um, uh, Toby Kebbell and a German actor called mm. Henneck uh, Schoenmann, I think that's his surname, and they, they team up, one from the British trenches and one from the German trenches to disentangle Joey from some barbed wire. And the dialogue in that, in that scene, Richard, is, is just some of the finest movie dialogue I've ever seen. It's so heartbreaking. And it's good because it's so normal. Mm. This, these, everyday, these everyday words in a completely... Um, in the seventh circle of hell, basically. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much, guys. I mean, that, that is all the time we have, I'm afraid. Give it up, please, for Richard Curtis and the Raptor King, Tom Hiddleston. Thank you. <laughs>